Welcome to the Embodiment Podcast. This show is for you if you see the body as more than a brain taxi. It's for people interested in coming home to the body as a holistic aspect of who we are and how we live. Episodes contain practical tips, exercises you can take away, and interviews with specialists from around the world. I'm your host for today, Mark Walsh. What is the future of embodiment? <clears throat> Where is this whole field going? So a few people didn't show up for random reasons for uh, interviews this week. So I decided to record another solo one. This was a question um, someone asked Rachel Blackman um, on the Facebook group. So she said, hey, have you got any questions for Mark ahead of me interviewing him for the 200th episode? And one question was, what is the future of embodiment? And I thought, wow, that's an interesting question. So I went away and thought about it. I'd kind of been thinking about it anyway. Um, you know, as a business owner in embodiment, I'm sort of always planning three to five years ahead, really, um, in terms of trends and where things are going. And it's just, you know, I'm kind of a geek. I'm a futurist science fiction kind of geek as well. And I thought, you know, rather than answer that in the interview in five minutes, um, I'd do like a 30-minute podcast on it or thereabouts. <laughs> So I was thinking about this from various directions and um, rather than try and predict the future, I think it's maybe better to talk about themes and trends. Um, actually, Rachel's answer to this was interesting. She answered it herself as well, which was um, Rachel Blackman is my colleague on EFC, by the way, so we're quite close. Um, she answered it this way, which was uh, in her vision of the future that it wouldn't be needed. Um, and it's certainly an optimistic view and certainly a possibility. You know, I've always said my my aim or my ambition was that my grandchildren don't understand why I have a job. Embodiment would be so normal, so part of um, daily life and everything we do that the field of embodiment wouldn't exist. Now, I think that's great to have as a long term vision, but I'm perhaps I'm not that optimistic and certainly in the short term. Um, however, you know, we could see this normalization of embodiment in the same way as we've seen mindfulness get more and more kind of normalized, you know, the apps, different schools in Britain using it, hospitals. Um, I think there'll be a bit of a backlash against that. There's quality control issues, there's various problems, but basically it'll get more and more integrated as a sort of secular stress relief for um, a, basically a mentally ill society, which is what we are now, one of the most mentally ill, um, suicidal, addicted, and many would say isolated as well as narcissistic, but stay with the other ones, societies that's ever existed, if not the most the most mentally ill society that's ever existed. Um, so mindfulness, I think, you know, could get integrated almost like a secular religion. And I think there will, there will become um, essentially kind of like a religion, but based around um, neuroscience and secular understandings of psychology that becomes a sort of the personal growth field becomes um, stuff that's now being done uh, outside of institutions and on leading edges gets more and more institutionalized till it becomes just just a huge part of life and again that's fairly science fictiony kind of long-term looking um, but I, I see even in the near future embodiment becoming a part of that so I feel like the mindfulness research I think yoga I already see is following in those footsteps and you know once it's come to yoga people also start looking at dance if you look at like helen the podcast with like helen Payne, i had a few other speakers at the conference doing research in this area obviously amy cuddy's power poses was a kind of big step forward then there's a bit of a step back with the replication issues and um people misunderstanding or misreplicating i would say a lot of her stuff but i see science getting more and more an evidence base growing more and more for it um becoming more and more mainstream it's a little hard to package sort of electronically than mindfulness, but we'll start seeing more and more apps for it. Um, you know, I, I think this is going to get picked up in a big way. Um, I think, for example, um, you know, Oprah is going to start having on mindfulness, uh, not mindfulness people, embodiment people. This is both a sort of hope and fear for me in the future. So there's a couple of fears here. One is just as a business, you know, I've put a lot of time and energy in the last kind of 12 years into running my business and getting uh strongly associated with this word and it being established both for my own business aims but also because i i really want the best stuff to be out there so that's what a lot of the podcast and the conference is about is saying you know what let's not have happened um to other disciplines happen to embodiment and it, it may well to some extent and you saw this you know with with mindfulness there'd be teachers that had 30 years experience that were completely ignored and just someone that happened to have a cool story and was a monk for one year or something or just happened to know the right people in london that set up their app company um shot them to fame um well they happened to get on tv or whatever so i think we will see that with embodiment it's kind of inevitable i've kind of accepted it already and i've gone okay if i can at least establish something um 
with the podcast, with the uh, conference and other things as a kind of quality control, as a kind of way of saying, hey, there are real elders in this field, you know, whether it's um, Don Hanlon Johnson or Paul Linden or Strozzi or whoever to say like, these guys are really worth um, listening to. And it's not all just one field. These, these guys, there's differences between them. Yeah. So as things get more and more integrated though, you know, what would it be like when we do have, you know, embodied leadership, just a normal part of management training school, a normal MBA, where, um, you know, embodiment, for, you know, PE for kids, physical education, what do you call it in America, phys ed, becomes just very normal. That's done in a much more embodied way. Um, you know, my niece is actually learning sort of self-regulation techniques, which are basically centering. Um, and she's learning those because she has ADHD, but she's she's pretty normal. And she's from a small town in the east of england we're not talking like some cutting edge funky liberal school um so it's all you know it's already happening so i think this increasing uh, mainstream acceptance of it you know it won't become weird to say i'm an embodiment teacher um and maybe the language will change you know maybe the word somatic will take off instead i think it won't because it's a bit weirder uh, maybe just body mind maybe some other completely different language and you know the, the word's definitely trending I mean, we're seeing this now, like the number of hits I get on my what is embodiment video has gone up a lot. Um, and I'm just seeing the word more and more tagged onto things. Um, the, the hashtag on Instagram has thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands, I think, of of, of mentions there. Um, I mean, increasingly, you know, my yoga students joke that it's uh, avocado salad hashtag embodiment. You know, it's increasingly it's associated with a few niche areas as well. So sort of feminine stuff like um kind of female orientated stuff particularly, um and sometimes sort of new agey stuff. Um, but recently I saw a bit of a milestone, which was a paid Facebook ad from sort of a semi famous um like NLP trainer type guy, kind of Tony Robbins is, but like kind of cheesy. Uh, as a Facebook ad that popped up onto my wall. Now, that's probably the algorithm because I use the word embodiment in my posts and things, but it was called embodied presenting or something like that. Um, and I thought, okay, that's a bit different because this guy isn't coming from the mainstream embodiment world. He's coming from the wider, bigger, more sort of financially orientated personal growth world. Um, equally, we could be talking about the future of all these different disciplines, you know, like yoga, certainly segmenting, certainly getting more and more niche I see yoga teachers having to sort of qualify more and more things. Um, I think I think the other thing we're seeing as well is more uh, kind of cross silo stuff. So the podcast, the conference is very much in the spirit of the times or spirit of the future, which is of distant disciplines talking to each other. So there were prototypes of this um, you know, integrated approach. Certainly, something like Russell Delman, I was with um, Russell Linda Delman, I was with recently. It's kind of a proto approach where they're combining like Feldenkrais with meditation, with um, like mindful inquiry based stuff. And, you know, that's what we do on the EFC course. It's what most of the decent embodiment courses are starting to do is realize that there are different pieces of the picture. So on on EFC, for example, we have you know improv comedy, we have conscious dance, we have meditation, we have some martial arty bits, some uh, you know tango evening. And it's all based around coaching, but we're noticing that these are all different inputs and are all worth doing because you will uh, experience different types of embodiment, different levels of embodiment, different subtleties of embodiment, relational, non-relational, uh, combative, uh, sensual, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you're going to learn about different sides yourself. And I, I feel like this challenge of integration is key. And this is really my personal life's work. And this is where I see the field developing and what I've been trying to do with EFC and other courses. Um, and, you know, in, in body yoga, we're integrating more wider somatic practices into yoga. It's how do they integrate and so not just throw them together? Um, there's a course coming up with Scott Lyons where he's got a bunch of different embodiment teachers and he's trying to integrate their teaching. So like in over a few days, they're bringing the teaching together, which I thought was really nice. Um, rather than just throwing a bunch of teachers at you, it's really inspired me to like, can we do something like that for the embodiment conference? Well, with the number of speakers, maybe not. It's certainly what we're doing with EFC and it's nice to see Scott do it. So kudos to him. Um, I'm trying to survey the field. So just to have a little experience in most embodiment areas, plus a lot in a few, uh, that's a lifetime's work. And there's very few people that have done it anywhere near like surveying what's possible. Um, someone like Bonnie Bainbridge Cohen or Richard Strozzi Heckler would be two that are kind of have come pretty near to it of the last generation. Um, I think in the modern age, it's much easier. 
it's much easier to have access to different things and to at least know about things on a relatively surface level, know about rather than necessarily have deep experience of personally. Um, but, you know, there's some possibility of that. You know, I was looking at Scott's CV and I was looking and saying, look, this is really, wow, I'd love to be there in 10 years' time. And there's a few kind of people of, of my generation and they're kind of, um, you know, 40s or maybe 50s um, who are um, developing this, not just doing lots of things, you know, but being real Renaissance men, Renaissance women who integrate it. Um, and I, I feel like that integration is the challenge of the time rather than being in the embodiment supermarket, you know, the embodiment sweet shop where we just, the risk I think in the future is not committing to anything and just doing everything on a shallow level. And we're already seeing this in places like, you know, many, you know, California and Boulder and places like that, maybe Berlin, the kind of hubs you're seeing the future of embodiment more generally where one can just pick and choose the things. And I'm really glad I had that obsession with Aikido and really committed to it and wasn't into other things for a good few years. You know, when I was living Aikido student, I, I worry that people won't have that. You know, the commitment may not be there. So the original sort of meditation teachers that brought meditation to the West in the kind of 60s and 70s, I mean, there were people before that, but that was the, the boom. Uh, they would have spent years meditating, you know, maybe as monks like Christopher Titmus or whatever, or, um, you know, the people of Spirit Rock in America, it's, you know, really long retreats. And now if someone's a teacher's done a, you know, a modern meditation's done a single three month retreat, it's kind of a big deal. Um, you know, whereas that generation were on retreat for years. Um, so I, you know, I wonder about um, if what is required, the commitment there will reduce, even as the, the depth will get lo lesser, even if the breadth gets wider. The other thing that I think is really significantly different is who's doing the embodied practice. So we're wired differently now. Uh, at 39, I'm wired differently, certainly for my older Aikido teachers. I can see it in their neurology. And, um, you know, I've grown, and even if they're sort of now using smartphones and things like that, we're wired pretty differently. And certainly millennials, I'm, you know, I'm certainly seeing issues around increasing sort of concentration issues. And I wonder how that's going to affect in terms of how sort of deep in embodied practice people are. Um, yeah, I, I think that could be a factor that may reduce the sort of quality of embodiment teachers, despite this huge profusion of kind of um, educational possibilities, which are only growing more, increasing the possibility. Um, now, I should take a step back here because some of this is sort of predisposed in this sort of future embodiment is predisposing we don't have some kind of global financial collapse uh, that the environmental systems don't get so bad that you know we all air travel gets stopped um you know there's no electricity for the internet and we're all kind of hunting and gathering again kind of thing and that's you know from talking to various people in the know there's certainly the idea of a sort of really serious global financial economic collapse is very is, is very possible um so you know that would make embodiment in some ways something of a luxury and it might be that embodied practice moved towards around like small community building again, like sort of traditional tribal models of sort of community dance and things like that. It may be some of the sort of hyper individualistic kind of somewhat narcissistic approach of embodiment um, starts to uh, seem like a luxury in the face of collapse. So that, you know, it's hard to predict this, obviously. Um, though, as I said, I know some very intelligent people who really looked into this, who are kind of making preparations, as it were. So, you know, whether our sort of current kind of middle-class trickle-down model of embod embodiment survives that, I doubt it. Um, it also brings us on to another factor that a lot of embodiment of the last generation was really coming out of the West Coast of the States. And Ezalan in particular, the Bay Area more, more broadly. There are other hubs, you know, Boulder and places like that. But... um. You know, that's, that was the big center for it. And that has a particular flavor. And those guys are just retiring or dying off. And I'm, I'm noticing a lot of them don't want to retire. There's a sort of weird perpetual youth fantasy that a lot of them have. You know, I'm going to keep working till I'm 98. Um, but what we're really seeing now is the death of the elders from that community. Many of them are either not working, working less, or in denial about it, but dropping down. You know, it's people like Stanley Kellerman have left us not that long ago. Um, Emily Conrad, and there's people who are just sort of trying to pass things on. And I think there's going to be real lineage succession problems. Um, 
because uh, lineage isn't a comfortable idea in the United States. It's kind of Japanese kind of maybe or, you know, other Asian traditions idea. Um, the other thing is, as it spreads to other countries, we're going to see different cultural flavours. So I'm maybe some of the vanguard of this in the UK. I bring my own sort of British humour and kind of British, sometimes cynicism, even a way of looking at things. It's very un-American. And I'm mid-Atlantic. Even my accent fucking sounds mid-Atlantic now. Um, I'm swearing. There's another one. Um, but um, it definitely as things get more British and I see my Russian colleagues get like deeper into the work, really develop the work. There's a Russian flavour developing. Um, some of my Russian students were sort of, you know, doing embodied fashion around style. It was very sort of like a Russian lady thing to do, but at a very, you know, sophisticated level and credit to them. Um, and I think we'll see that as embodiment um, reappears in different countries or uh, the American West Coast influence kind of declines as that generation's kind of, you know, they're really past their, their heyday anyway. They're elders, but they're, I think they're no longer kind of thought leaders often. No, you know, the quality of work out there can be very good. Um, this, it's not the generation I'm seeing produce the most kind of cool original stuff anymore. Um, so it will be very interesting to see when we have other embodiment hubs. Like, you know, certainly I've been spending time in Berlin and it's going to be, you know, there's already been one emergence there kind of in the early 20th century. So I think there could well be another one there due to the particular conditions um, of Berlin and other hubs that, you know, what would a really Australian embodiment be like? They're Australians and if you're out there, get a uh, third biggest country that listens to this. Um so that's pretty interesting. New Zealand's up there on the list of people that listen to this podcast too. Spain is up there. Um, you know, these are the countries that have got the biggest listenerships outside of um, US, Canada and UK. And the UK one's pretty biased by my contacts and influences. So that would be interesting, the sort of cross-cultural side of it. You know, these Israelis have already done interesting stuff. Um, and, you know, what about if there is this large developing sort of middle class in places like India and China? We're also going to get this fascinating phenomenon which is already happening of western embodied disciplines going to the east uh, i've seen this in japan and china and rejuvenating those places and bringing them back in there's very interesting confrontations happening now between traditional embodied arts let's say chinese kung fu and chinese people doing mma so you know this is you can google this there's a, a guy out there who's really ruffling some feathers um, and also, you know, what when the Western practices like body psychotherapy and Feldenkrais and different things are brought into the East, like what that combination looks like from the other side, because essentially the combination of East and Western embodied practices was the birth of, you know, the Ezelan birth of the um, the work that's most prevalent today. So that's going to be pretty interesting um, when it when there's a sort of enough of middle class there and things kind of really go back East. And there are definitely Western contributions um, to be had there as well as traditionalists who may be upset with that and others who are integrators you know like the, you know the Japanese have this great way of taking what the West does and improving it and it'd be interesting to see what they do um, with truly somatic practices and there's resistances to that there's cultural reasons why that might not happen but I think it will oh, I was taking a breath and drinking some water here it's come back from Pete Blackaby's yoga class which is fantastic um, okay so let's take a bit more. This is going to be way more than half now. Let's talk a little bit about shallow versus deep. So, you know, I mentioned we could have this like supermarket or there could be a way in which people decide, you know, really to go back into one thing. Often there's these kind of swings and I think the sort of supermarket thing may end up swinging the other way and to have truly integrated schools will be fascinating, particularly if they're kind of research based, there's um, neuroscience behind it. That being said, there's a bit of a bubble around neuroscience. It may be that that bubble bursts and the sort of fashion for that goes. Um, and that might be the short term. Um, equally, I think if we look at it long term, we're going to have some sort of technology that comes in. But I want to come back to that in a minute. One thing I haven't really addressed so far is the sort of guru thing. So um, someone said we live in a post-lineage age, just Theo Wildcraft, I think. And um, this idea that post-guru, you know, I talk about... Uh, the the non guru method at EFC and we always have co teachers and, and and guest teachers to bring in different perspectives. I can see that increasing, um, particularly in the short term. I feel like there's a um, how can I put this uh, a kind of postmodern trend towards the individual and hyper individualism, which makes the guru system kind of not appropriate because of its ethical letdowns, but also because of just the general climate. So there's a sort of positive and a negative to this. You know, one is not necessarily respecting elders and what comes before. And uh, the other one is um, 
uh, yeah, actually, actually being suspicious of gurus um, because of all the abuse cases and the scandal. So I can see that increasingly, you know, kind of younger generation coming up are going to be increasingly suspicious of that. And I, and I think, you know, we're seeing an increasing um, lower bar for people to get kind of taken down as gurus. And, you know, I can even see that happen to myself at some point. There's some kind of a takedown attempt when, I don't know, some ex-employee or ex-girlfriend or something, you know, comes out of the closet and, and it gets blown up and presented in a certain way. Um, and I th- as I said, I think the sort of healthy side of questioning gurus is something I've always been behind and supporting. And it'll be interesting to see if that becomes just a sort of pathological distrust of leaders. Uh, politically, traditionally, the left has done this. It's always kind of the left has always sort of eaten their own. And embodiment as it stands is very, very left orientated. You know, I'd say 95% of embodiment teachers around the world are kind of voting for the left parties uh, in their countries. There's a few conservatives out there. But I, I for example, I only know of one um, openly Trump supporting embodiment teacher. And he does pretty primitive kind of embodiment. There's a few quiet ones, I suspect, out there. Uh, and there's definitely some sort of more moderate, intelligent kind of conservatives out there. But I still say 90%, 5% are on the left. And the left has this habit of eating its leaders. And I think that is going to continue. Um, and, and that may come to a head where people go, well, hang on a minute. Um, is this really what we want? You know, and and this really points to the kind of left, the hard left and postmodern left, or something people call authoritarian left, or regressive left influence on embodiment, which we're really seeing in the world today, um, particularly in the States, a little bit in places like Berlin in the UK, but mostly in the States, and even more in places like Boulder in the West Coast. Um, so let me just say the positives. I think people are interested in fairness, they're interested in diversity, uh, and there's, there's real benefits there, there's real positive things, right? We may be that old white men do not have the entire uh, uh, life experience that's necessary to speak to human embodiment, you know? Um, you know, what's funny for me is often the cultural blindness of the United States while simultaneously demanding this kind of um, uh, ethnic diversity, for example, or diversity around sexuality, which, you know, as someone that's worked with gay communities, someone that lives in a, a very, very gay town, traditionally Brighton, um, it, you know, I understand this, I understand that different points of view are needed, different perspectives, bringing in voices that just haven't been heard, you know, Um there's been something very white, very middle class. That's the one the Americans don't always spot, the class issue um, around embodiment. And I feel like we're going to experience more voices. We're going to have different perspectives. Um, my hope is that's international and not just kind of according to the five, uh, it's usually about five perspectives that the Americans are particularly focused on. And I think it can get a bit wider than that. You know, I'd love, to, you know, Russian voices, for example, are, you know, white, but completely different perspective than you'll get from a sort of middle class American. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm enjoying that that could be brought to the table. Um, where I'm afraid, frankly, is that it will get very woke. And, you know, I'm already seeing this. I'm already seeing a kind of... Um, guilt i'm seeing um people giving speaking slots who maybe don't have the experience to back it up due to positive discrimination and I, I'm not necessarily against that but i can definitely see some problems with that um i'm seeing uh, an aggression towards white heterosexual male teachers like myself even if they're um uh you know relatively centrist like myself or even left-leaning and no that isn't just uh a kind of like, oh, this equality feels like I'm being hard done by. No, I'm, I'm really seeing people getting closed down and um, belittled and not giving speaking slots, uh, and then et cetera, et cetera. So I slightly worry this this very politically correct trend will continue to deepen an embodiment because the hub for that really is the West Coast. That's also the hub for embodiment and this, this kind of left bias, essentially, um, that exists. Um, equally, I'm seeing a bit of a pushback um, from sort of conservative voices, um, and, you know, there's certainly people like, you know, Rafe Kelly, for example, a very intelligent, compassionate conservative who's a friend of mine who, you know, puts stuff out there from that kind of point of view and a few others. And, you know, interestingly, privately, a, a lot of senior embodiment teachers are a bit more conservative than they publicly dare admit. You know, none of them are sort of alt-right Nazis or anything like that. Um, you know, I haven't met a single kind of alt-right embodiment teacher. I've met a few that have been accused of it, but... It's really ridiculous when you actually look at, you know, their actual lifestyle and who they vote for and all the rest of it. Um, but there's definitely a few more sort of quietly conservative people that are keeping that under wraps. And what that's creating is almost like a, um, how can I put this? Almost like a, um, 
counterculture or a um, hidden subculture within embodiment of sort of people who are pretty developed personally, who aren't ignorant of issues of sort of diversity and liberality, but have maybe kind of got to a, a certain, you know, if we look at this in terms of levels of development, like spiral dynamics, like a level seven or a integral or a yellow point of view, um, you can look at the podcast and know that that doesn't make any sense, who have incorporated some of that sensitivity, um, some of that uh, ballot interest in fairness, but uh, but have brought in something else. Have brought in some, some in- integrated some more conservative values. Um, Jonathan Height's work H I D T is really interesting on values of the left and the right, and, and that would be my hope that there's a sort of at first almost hidden um, lead edge of embodiment, and that lead edge eventually becomes a kind of dominant public edge. I feel there's a way to go yet, yeah, as we might go through a sort of dangerous period where. Um, sort of weaponized sensitivity becomes the norm in embodiment. I'm, you know, the word safe, for example, just wasn't used um, until five years ago in the UK as ever, certainly not as a feeling. And now it's increasingly used in a number of ways, some of which are, um, you know, very helpful, like Stephen Porges' polyvagal theory, for example, but others of which I see as um, ways to control people, ways to get attention, um, ways to just not have basic adult robustness. And, you know, the trauma has become massive. And again, there may be a bubble there. There may be a way in which that sort of trauma trend passes. I think, you know, like all trends, it will it will come and go. I mean, it will, I hope, increasingly inform embodiment generally. I do support that and encourage that. Um, but I think it can be taken to an extreme, particularly with this very sensitive and very politically correct um, kind of um, accommodation of it. So everyone's triggered, everyone's traumatized. Everything has to be safe. We can't assume adult robustness. I think this is a real problem for the embodiment world. If that sort of mix of sort of hard left politics and increasingly trauma informed or even trauma pandering um, gets gets in, you know, that being said, I don't want people to misunderstand me. I do hope the general trend of genuine high quality trauma education, you know, David Bocelli, Irene Lyons, Peter Levine, we've had people on the show um who um support that so i do see that deepening but maybe there'll be a backlash from the conservative side or from people going well hang on a minute is this being um misused in a way which is not beneficial which takes away just the ability to practice you know the ability to um do a lot of practices will be accused of being unsafe you know this this i feel unsafe it's very close to an accusation of you're unsafe you're a bad person and not always used that way but i have definitely heard it used that way i was in a um circling group not long ago where someone got very upset at me because i sat too close to them and bear in mind we we're in a circle and there really wasn't a whole lot of choice and this person could have just moved actually but um you know i was several inches away from them four or five inches and they said they felt violated and i was in this space and used all these words that i would associate with really serious trauma and as someone who's works in war zones like you know i found it a little pathetic if i'm honest and that's a bit judgmental i know but it was just like dude get yourself together you know like this is this is sort of almost comical in the sensitivity um so that trend towards the sort of millennial triggered sensitivity as as kind of more millennial teachers become senior teachers, that may get entrenched and it also may create a backlash. And I hope that backlash isn't throwing the baby out with the bathwater of, of trauma education. Cause I, you know, I definitely see, um, yeah, definitely see some, some really positive, some really positive things in that. So, so, you know, my hope for the future is we it reintegrate some more, uh, conservative values. We're able to have embodiment really genuinely for everyone, you know, like how many how many Trump supporters would really be welcome at your yoga class or your meditation retreat? I mean, genuinely, if someone walked in in a MAGA hat, would they be welcome? And I'm not saying that, of course, you know, of course, I don't support Trump. Of course, I you know find him repulsive in many ways. And a lot of his policies I find very disturbing, particularly the um, separation of children from parents. Um, and, you know, that is a big percentage of the population in America. And in Britain, it's the Brexit thing, right? So it's like, you know, I I had sort of, sort of once I was in a yoga class and the teacher came in and said, "Yes, Jeremy Corbyn's been um made the uh, opposition leader now." Jeremy Corbyn, I quite like in some ways, but he's very hard left. He's certainly the the hardest left Labour leader for a long time. That's our left leaning party. And I thought, wow, if anyone in this room right now is is conservative or even a very you know centrist, they would be feeling not welcome in this yoga class. Um, so you know, this is my hope and really something of a sort of prayer and a challenge and a. 
um, encouragement out there is, is can we actually have dialogue? Can we make embodiment something that's really available to everyone? Yes, in, absolutely, including skin color, sexuality, um, this kind of, you know, all the general uh, disabilities, larger people, people in wheelchairs, etc. cetera. Um, absolutely, 100%. And I feel like that's a really positive move. So I want to really underline how positive I think that move is in the embodiment world. We're not thinking of everyone as, say, able-bodied anymore. Um, you know, we are understanding that there are voices that maybe haven't been heard, you know, and simultaneously, does that inclusivity, does that inclusion also include diversity of opinion, diversity of perspective, diversity of politics um, as well? Because otherwise, you know, embodiment is just really going to keep deepening the sort of smug left's view of itself as superior. And I think that that's really a problem. Um, you know, this is different in different fields. So there are slightly more conservative martial artists, for example, we will, you know, you will see this in different fields. I think the other the other piece that's interesting is um, how this new view of the body is not being so important to identity um, or in a more complex way, certainly how that is integrated into embodiment. So um, people might say, well, my body is this, but I identify as that, you know, increasingly I'm hearing that, that kind of thing uh, as standard as part of the embodied narrative. Um, you know, that is an interesting challenge to the embodiment field, which says, yeah, actually our self is embodied. Uh, I think no one really wants to go near this because it's pretty uncomfortable. It's pretty delicate territory. And, you know, I'm already slightly worried that someone's going to be uh, misinterpreting what I'm saying here. But it, it's going to be, it's certainly a challenge that this different, this sort of slightly postmodern view, that uh, can be like an antibody trend in in the current um uh, you can think of this as a sort of postmodern force, which is which is very much more, first of all, interested in the body. Feeling and emotion and intuition are absolutely central. And there's a sort of pushing aside of logic sometimes at the expense of that. That worldview is now becoming um, powerful. You see it in Hollywood now, you see it in local government, you see it in definitely, you've seen it for a long time in education, but it's going from the sort of universities and Berkeley and places like that to mainstream environments, which is good news for embodiment on the one hand, because it's saying, look, subjectivity matters. Embodiment's about subjectivity. Feeling matters, absolutely. The body matters. Emotion matters, absolutely. Uh, it's not all logical. You know, we might want to return to the wisdom of the body, which is positive. But then it can have this also this, um, this trend towards uh, kind of like hyper abstraction, or at least the potential for what, what's being called ideological possession. So in ideology, facts don't matter. Um, and, and, and also the body doesn't matter in that sense. So you, we, I was watching the Chernobyl series recently. It's absolutely brilliant that they were saying, you know, under the Soviet system, they were saying, look, this is this, this reactor cause exploded. And people were saying it can't have done, even though the, all the evidence said it had. Their ideology was that sort of Soviet atomic power was so superior, there was no way this could have happened. And people's ideology really got in the way of the reality. And I, I think we'll see that with embodiment in different ways. And there's going to be challenges between... Um, there's going to be challenges and there's going to be uh, certainly contested ground um, when we see kind of a kind of far left kind of ideologically possessed group um, meet with embodiment teachers who are maybe seeing things from a more sort of balanced point of view. Um, and as I said, I don't want anyone to hear that to say, I don't think that the move towards increasing voices, marginalized voices, isn't a good thing. So I think it's fucking fantastic. And I, I really see that. And I, I wish it was more inclusive to include actually even more inclusive to include things like class. Um, you know, the number of yoga teachers to now who are good looking, you know, the, the, so it's the number of yoga teachers, even if they're larger, you know, they'd be very attractive physically because of the marketing world we live in. There's all sorts of groups that have been um, not, represented and linguistically and, and culturally I think it's one of the biggest ones anyway maybe I've gone on for too long on that um, uh, we could talk a little bit around um, technology so actually we may all be made unemployed as embodiment teachers by technological innovation you know like there was a kind of a vest on the market from Switzerland which never I think it was just in a like prototype stage and I never saw it come to fruition which would affect your your posture it would give you little like little electrical nudges um there's been sort of some crude versions of this but when this is sophisticated maybe when it's linked to virtual reality which is a 
again, a very big challenge to being just embodied. You think of how disembodied we become on a sitting at a computer online all day. You know, that's a challenge to embodiment generally, as I mentioned before. Virtual reality is going to be an even bigger challenge to that, you know, and there are science fiction films where there's sort of either grotesquely obese or tiny, tiny, skinny people who have just plugged into virtuality all day long and they're, you know, they're really put on a life support almost just to keep their physical functions going. And that may well, particularly if the world starts to um, disintegrate a little bit, like what was that player one movie can become more attractive, more interesting than your actual self. So that's definitely a challenge to embodiment. And it could also be a great teaching tool. You know, imagine if you could put on a suit and there was an Aikido teacher or a dance teacher on the other side of the world. And that suit would take you through the moves and it would take you through the moves and then it would gradually reduce the input until you did the moves and it, and it would give you a, a sense of that. Or if there's technology which could help us interior set. So rather than, you know, this addictive clickbait, uh, click on the, you know, the shiny thing kind of technology that's currently um, hooked us in a way, you know, that is going to get worse. So that's definitely a possibility for the future. You know, another one is there's technology which is really helping us interior set, um, which is helping us feel very deeply. Um, as I said, combined with sort of advanced neuroscience stuff, uh, there's, there's the idea of the enlightenment cap, you know, this idea that you could put on a little helmet and it would zap your brain and make you enlightened. Now, I don't think that's um, exactly going to happen, but there are some people really seriously working on this technology. And if you can do it with enlightenment, you can sure as hell can do it with embodiment. So that's going to be very, very interesting, like how the technology um comes in you know increasing by feedback increasing body hacking like you know i use a muse headband to measure my brain waves you know now what about the apple watches might measure pulse or heart rate variability say but it's increasingly this could get more and more sensitive it can get more and more sophisticated hormone levels neurotransmitter levels um this is going to be very interesting for embodiment practice you know imagine everyone's in a yoga class and they have a little wristband or a headband or maybe a a, a chip that's implanted into their bloodstream and the yoga teacher can like monitor everyone's like cortisol levels and adrenaline levels and um serotonin levels throughout the class and adjust their practice you know maybe that's all on a monitor maybe the teacher's getting it as biofeedback from all the you know the the, the, the chemical levels of all the students are being by uh, by feedback like led into stimulants or whatever into the um, um, uh, yoga teacher this may sound far-fetched and very out as Huxley but it's actually not that far away I would say not that far away okay this is another trend that I'm seeing from the science fiction to the sort of more visible in the immediate future um, that of extremity so I'm seeing um, increasingly people wanting more and more extreme things you know hot yoga ice baths multiple marathon running I predict that like hardcore S and M will also become very acceptable. We saw Fifty Shades of Grey um, really become you know one of the most popular books ever sold. I think you know sort of light porn, very badly written apparently. When S and M people tell me, um, I'm seeing Shibari, this kind of rope work, get increasingly accepted, particularly amongst young people. You know, this is also you know most young people have tattoos, so the idea of sort of pain and altering one's body permanently or near permanently is very normalised. So I think we're going to see some very more extreme embodiment practices. Um, I think they'll just walking over the hot coals won't be enough. There'll be some very extreme practices that become very, very normal. Um, you know, there's some interesting work on the decline of civilizations. And one of the things that there's, uh, there's books on this, and there's, there's set patterns and more and more extreme sexual practices, physical practices uh, may well become the norm in embodiment. Um you know, we're already seeing a sort of an uncouthness in embodiment, which I um I led the way in. You know, one of the first embodiment teachers to swear, and I wish I'd I wish I'd got there ahead of Mark Manson and his book How Not to Give a Fuck and the subtle art of not giving a fuck and all this kind of thing. Though it's normally F star star K, isn't it? Um, yeah, and this kind of increasingly kind of sweary, edgy. You know, I kind of really led the way in that, and I'm I'm slightly amused at some of the fakers in this field now because none of them. Very few of them are actually very edgy. Um, however, I definitely see that as a trend. You know, we've had the like rock and roll meditation with the rock and roll embodiment. I definitely see coming in. Uh, I remember 10 years ago, I had teachers say, you know, you can't possibly swear. I mentioned sex or any of those things. And, you know, now it's it's almost an active selling point um, to some of my trainings. Um, you know, for me, it feels like authentic. I came from an Irish family and, you know, working class kind of farm village background. So for me, it was just there, but um, yeah, I think we'll increasingly see that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, as I said, more and more extreme practices. Um, 
as people go for that. And then again, the counter movement. So you had more and more extreme yoga, then you had yin yoga. So you'll also get, I think, a return to things like Feldenkrais. Um, you know, Feldenkrais, it's interesting, like what practices are ahead of their time that may now blossom. So Feldenkrais is one I can think of. Um, it's interesting to see trends. You know, some of the trends come simply from practicalities like let me give you an example like yoga you can fit a lot of yoga mats in a room somewhere like new york or london which tends to be trend setting places they can um it's just very practically uh, this is the only way they can afford the rent now if that was a dance studio it's less likely to happen i i do think we'll see uh, more general embodiment studios coming in i may start one i'm definitely seeing a few prototypes of that um, and i think we'll definitely see um studios of other things so we're seeing full-time meditation studios now i'm be teaching at one of in the ukraine in a few months um there's i went to my a full-time circling studio um in austin um run by my friend jordan very well run a nice place big up to jordan um and this was um you know, that was phenomenal for me to see a business that was based around circling. So I, I think the yoga studio has um, made it normal. And we will start seeing more sort of permanent studios, particularly in the States where rents are cheaper, or other countries like Australia where there's space. You know, that's harder in places like the UK or the Netherlands where where there's just much more crowded and rents much more, you know, expected. Like, people out there might not realise this, but there's very few, say, um, permanent Aikido studios in the UK compared to the US. So the US, there might be a thousand, in the UK, there might be three, um, which doesn't represent the population difference because of the... Um, uh, because of this difference in rents and, and spaciousness. So, you know, that's a factor. There's the practical factors there. There's also the practical factors like you get a bit of a buzz from yoga. You can kind of feel like you're doing it semi-right. Tai Chi, on the other hand, is much more frustrating. You're not getting the same endorphin here. Um, so I think those practical factors may dictate um, which things are there. And, you know, fads come and go. We'll see the the ice this or the breathing method that, you know, breathing methods are certainly trending right now, coming back in in a big way. Um, so I think we'll see those trends come and go. And when you've been around a while, there can be this sense of like, oh, this this again, you know, this is a rebirthing or holotropic breath work or, you know, something that's already been around in the 60s could well get recycled. You know, sometimes all it takes is a celebrity or someone with a um, uh, kind of good marketing, basically. Okay, so thanks to... Heidi, I hope I'm saying your name right in New Zealand. I always have a mental block around that. Heidi, Heidi, Heidi. You know who you fucking are. Anyway, um, you're a mate. I like you a lot. I hope to see you in New Zealand again for asking this question. Thank you to Rachel for um, going to it. Also, thanks to the group. So the Facebook group for um, the podcast, if you put embodiment, um, embodiment, sorry, I'm tired, embodiment podcast into Facebook, you'll come up with a page and a group. The group's really the one to go for. Um, thank you to everyone who, who from the EFC community who also contributed to that. Okay, so I think they're the main ones I wanted to cover. Um, da, 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 I'm just checking my notes here. I actually made some notes for a change. This has gone on a bit, and I'm supposed to be calling Paul Linden. So, um, yeah, who the fuck knows, really? Let's see what happens. There are a few of my musings on the subject. I hope there's something useful in that for you. Some ways to uh, get more, to give back, and to get more involved now. So um, the biggest request I have would be to share the podcast with your friends, people that you think would really enjoy it, um, email it to them, put it on your social media, tell them about it, old school. Um, yeah, really appreciate that. Equally, if you want to support us financially, you can go to Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash embodiment podcast, and give us a dollar an episode. And I'd say they're well worth a dollar. So um, that's less Less than a pound if you're in UK ish. So, yeah, please go there. Um, on the embodyfacilitator.com website is where this is hosted. If you're most people, I think, listen to for iTunes, um, iTunes, we'd certainly appreciate a review. The way iTunes works means that a review means more people will find it. iTunes regards it as more important for searches. So, even a couple of sentences review really does help as a little thank you to us. And if you want to go to embodyfacilitator.com, you can see the actual you know links to the sites comments on there um, the Facebook group tends to be where people discuss things so if you go to uh, put in the embodiment podcast into Facebook there's a page which is relatively quiet and a group which does have some discussion on so um, yeah I will reply to things personally there so um, also on embodiedfacilitator.com website uh, there's all sorts of freebies there there's videos there's free ebooks there's ebooks you can buy 
And of course, is our newsletter list. If you want to stay in touch and learn about things like the Embodied Facilitator course and our, um, you know, our next Embodied Yoga Principles teacher training, then go to that website and you'll see a little pop up and you can um, get the newsletter through there. OK, so I think they're the main ones. Tell your friends, pay us some money on Patreon, give us a review on iTunes, uh, send us your email if you want to be on the newsletter list and get involved on the Facebook there. Oof, bit long. Uh, pick whatever you like that works for you. Until next time, welcome home to the body.